This has become this. That's become that. And these have become these. The withdrawal of Western brands from Russia has changed the face of Russian shopping streets. So who exactly are these copycat brands? The replacer of McDonald's was called Tasty and that's it. Ridiculous name, I think. <laughs> and how do they compare with the originals? This isn't McDonald's. After other brands pulled their products from the shelves, are Russians still able to get the Western goods they want? If you want a can of Coke, or if you want a brand new iPhone, or if you want a pair of sneakers, it is available. Can these brands do anything to stop that? The situation has just presented uh, this, this vacuum to these bad actors, and there will have to be some enforcement activity to right this, this situation. Over a year into the Western corporate exodus from Russia, has the Kremlin managed to sidestep the problems, or will the impact prove painful and permanent? Answers to all these questions coming up. This is Business Beyond. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, some of the biggest US and European brands have taken the decision to pull out of Russia completely, shutting their outlets and refusing to allow their products to be sold there. This decision came at a price. Olga Kamenchuk has been keeping a close eye on the firms exiting Russia. Russian market is significant in size. 140 million people live in the country, so it was a costly decision and yet they made it. Since then, the vacuum left by these gigantic brands has been filled in two ways. One, by Russian businesses and Russian shoppers finding innovative ways to get hold of Western products that are no longer being sold by those brands in Russia. We'll talk about that later. And two, replacement businesses have opened up, promising an almost identical experience to the Western originals. And it's those that we're going to look at first. Let's start with the most symbolic of all departures, that of McDonald's. The Golden Archer's arrival in Moscow in the dying days of the Soviet Union and Muscovite's eagerness to get through the doors was a meaty manifestation of American capitalism's victory over Soviet communism. But the closure of its Russian restaurants three decades later, in the early months of the war in Ukraine, was a stark reminder of the ideological differences that continue to separate East and West. McDonald's sold its 850 outlets to this man, Alexander Gavor, and within weeks they were open again, with a new colour scheme and a new name. Guzna i Tochka. Translation, tasty, and that's it. Russian vloggers were quick to post their experiences of this new arrival on the high street and compare it with its famous predecessor. Smells somewhat like McDonald's. Now, a lot of Russians say that the experience in these replacement restaurants is very similar to the real thing. But there are certain key items missing from the menu. For example, no Big Mac. The new restaurant's signature sandwich is presumptuously called the Big Hit. Other trademark names are also missing from the menu, like the McFlurry. In the early days of Kuznery Tochka, you couldn't even get fries with that thanks to a sanctions-driven shortage of potatoes. And that's not the only economic effect that's proven a drag for the fast food chain. The new McDonald's, the tasty and that's it, McDonald's had to raise prices recently. There were expectations maybe it will affect the demand. So far, it did not. Uh, one of the reasons, major, one of the major reasons why they had to raise the prices, I think, is inflation, which followed um, the sanctions uh, that were imposed on Russia. Self-sanctioning is a term sometimes applied to the firms who voluntarily withdrew from Russia, albeit after some pressure from back home. KFC and even Pizza Hut, whose advertising once featured former President Mikhail Gorbachev himself, have announced they're leaving Russia and have sold their assets. But another American icon that's already upped and left is the world's biggest coffeehouse chain, Starbucks. Not that you'd notice out of the corner of your eye, Star's coffee slipped seamlessly into its stead. Putting the star in Star's coffee is Kremlin-friendly rapper Timothy, who is one of the owners of the new chain. Of course, it isn't just the big American brands that have left Russia. 
certain big blue buildings are no longer occupied by their Swedish owner. IKEA was replaced by the Belarusian brand Sweat House, which also makes uh, simple furniture. Uh, although I have to say IKEA wasn't so simple for Russians, not everybody could afford that. And it was mostly represented by stores uh, in large cities for that reason, because the larger the city, the higher is the salary. That's why Moscovites miss it most. A look inside a Sweat House superstore reveals something barely distinguishable from IKEA. Similar items with similar labels, with similarly Nordic sounding names. Sweat House is actually unlike the other replacement businesses we've talked about so far because it isn't some Russian upstart. It's an established Belarusian company. And that's part of a trend of foreign firms from friendly or neutral countries filling the gaps left by Western brands. This was once Spanish retailer Zara's flagship Moscow store, but now it's occupied by Lebanese-owned Marg. Its parent company, Daher Group, bought all 502 stores owned by Zara's parent, Inditex, which also runs Bershka, Pull and & Bear, and Massimo Dutti. And other nationalities are also finding a new home on Russia's shopping streets. Fast fashion was substituted mostly by Turkish brands. Since the beginning of the war, um, Turkish business has flourished in the country, in Russia. So what do Russians make of the changing names that they see around them? Are they just as happy now the local Krispy Kreme has become a crunchy dream? Are they missing US brand Dunkin when they queue up for a Donutto instead? And are they bothered that the Lego store has been refashioned into World of Cubes? On the one hand, uh, there is a group of people who think that it's not worse, everything is fine, um, and we're, we're good as we are. We, we, we will be fine. And I think probably those would be the ones coinciding with those who say that uh, they don't, um, you know, they are, that they are upset and that they don't want the brands back. But on the other hand, uh, there is a sizable amount of people uh, who are joking about the replacements, who find it funny. They are joking about the, repla the replacement of McDonald's. You can't replace it. Some say Belarusian furniture is not Swedish furniture. And it's that Swedish furniture that Russians say they're missing the most. A survey suggests IKEA is the brand they're finding it hardest to live without. The top three brands were IKEA, uh, McDonald's and Zara. So representing very different things, right? Home decor, uh, fast food and uh, fast fashion. And Russians are also revealing how much affection they have for these Western names when they find themselves in countries that still have them. Many parts of the world don't want to see Russians there. Uh, so there is much less tourism going to European countries. But, for example, in Turkey, uh, Russians used to go there before the war. It was one of the popular destinations for summer vacation, and they do this now. And only now I see something I've never seen before. When people go to their, you know, some Turkish resort, and besides swimming in the ocean, or well, swimming in the sea, they um, go to IKEA, <laughs> or they take a selfie with a you know Starbucks coffee cup, which again isn't a big deal maybe for us, but once you don't have it, <laughs> you realize that you miss this brand. So um, they take pictures with a Starbucks behind them. And it's that allegiance to these American and European brands that the replacements are trying to capitalize on. That's why their product offerings are so similar to the originals. But the extent of the emulation does raise a question. How are they getting away with it? That's the question I put to Iris Gunter from the International Trademark Association. These, let's say, imitating or imitator or imposter brands, whatever you want to call them, have essentially used the fact that some of our well-known famous marks and brands have uh, for various well-known reasons, uh, remove themselves for the time being from the Russian market. So some of these new stores that have opened restaurants, some of the products that are being sold may well be infringing, may well be considered uh, to violate local trademark laws uh, and also the, the local jurisprudence, but it does take a plaintiff. So basically, the Western brand's withdrawal from Russia means that they're not around to defend their trademarks. So does that mean that their intellectual property, what makes McDonald's McDonald's or Starbucks Starbucks, 
It's fair game. Absolutely not. In my opinion, they're not fair game. Um, and I am sure that uh, several of these large companies are considering their options, um, taking action against these players. Just like in any other market, bad faith actors take advantage of vacuums like the one that has presented itself due to the political situation to uh, advance to advance their own interests. Let's take a look at the other aspect of the Western withdrawal that I wanted to talk about. Because not only have Western businesses been closing their outlets in Russia, but they've been trying to prevent their products being sold there altogether by anyone. But a look on the shelves of stores across Russia tells you that that hasn't gone to plan. Sure, there are replacement brands here too. Cool Cola instead of Coca-Cola and Fancy instead of Fanta. But you can also get the real thing. When it comes to the comforts of life that Russians are very much used to and the flow of high-end luxury goods as well as standard consumer goods, um, you can pretty much find everything that you want in Moscow. It's perhaps a bit more expensive, but if you want a can of Coke or if you want a brand new iPhone or if you want a pair of sneakers or even medicine, it is available. And the reason why it is so easily accessible is because there is demand and supply is not complicated. Ram Ben Sion is founder of Ultra, a company that helps agencies to keep an eye on what goods are moving around the world. The most common way to get consumer products into Russia is parallel imports. Parallel imports are a way in which Western goods can easily find their way into Russia, simply because Russia allows certain products to cross into the country without the trademark holder's permission. It's a very common trade practice that basically means I'm not sending my product directly to Moscow. I will send my products to the distributor in Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, Georgia, a wide range of neighboring countries that do not have the need or desire to enforce sanctions. And from there on, it will be conveyed in trucks into Russia easily uh, all the time. The Kremlin maintains a list of the products that it will allow to be imported in this way. And it's been adding to it since the Western backlash against its full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And of course, that list has now gotten a lot longer, a lot longer, because uh, the brands are not coming in or the products that people like and love and want to buy are not coming in uh, through the regular channels anymore. Um, so they've essentially just opened that list up to pretty much any product. The list is allowing goods from all manner of European, American and Japanese brands to be available in Russia, despite the brands no longer selling to Russian retailers. So you will see if you are Coca-Cola or if you're Colgate, you'll see a surge in demand of your representatives in neighboring countries, whereas the goods end up in Moscow and St. Petersburg. This, of course, means that Russians aren't getting the versions of those products intended for the Russian market. Instead, they're getting versions from all over the world. I can share with you actual footage of Polish, Danish, uh, and I think Kyrgyzstan Coca-Cola on a shelf line one next to another. Right. So you would not be able to walk into the Nike store, but if you want to get a pair of Nikes, you'll get them. Right. It's all there. Parallel imports are by no means the only way that Russians are managing to get hold of the Western products that they crave. Another one is using a little something called the internet. There's no shortage of websites that are happy to link up importers of uncontrolled goods with eager Russian shoppers. So you will go to Yandex, which is the very popular Russian website like Amazon, and I welcome you to search for Coca-Cola, Colgate, iPhone, Nike, Adidas. Everything is available. If you will allow me to share my screen. Yeah. So obviously you see the different types of Coca-Colas that you can buy. But what is atypical, you see the little flag here? Georgia. Yeah, Georgian flag. Right. So in some cases, there's actually a specific indication, okay, this is British Coca-Cola, maybe it's more expensive. So you can choose pretty much every product. It could be Coca-Cola or an iPhone, the brand new 14 or Colgate. 
you'll get the results. And there's also a third way that Russians are getting hold of these items, and one that cuts out the middleman. They're sourcing these items from overseas themselves. They have friends somewhere abroad, in any country really, um, I don't know, Kazakhstan, uh, Armenia, or United States, or Germany, they ask them to send things. I personally was asked to help buy uh, clothing for children um, through uh, H&M. <laughs> Again, a brand we're used to, not a big deal, right? I mean, once you don't have it, you notice it. I know that um, some people are making um, kind of small businesses out of it. So again, we have to ask, how is this able to happen? And the answer is that Russian law allows it. And that means the affected brands can't do an awful lot about it. There's not much, in my opinion, or at least I don't know of much that uh, these brands can do, um, except to try to work with local authorities when the products are, let's say, faulty or really so different from the ones that are normally sold on the market that you would consider them materially different and thereby try to stop them. However, what I have heard is that working with the enforcement agencies on the ground, meaning customs and police, that has become, from what I heard, a little difficult. The Russian authorities appear to have decided to take a permissive stance and to allow the products that Russians want into the country, perhaps as a way of maintaining levels of public support for the Kremlin's war in Ukraine. But while that may seem like a smart move now, it may well backfire. Why is this a problem in the long term? When you enable an illegitimate, even criminal infrastructure to drive products into the country to serve a short-term requirement, it will remain there in the long term. So these mechanisms that now have been trained and created to ship in goods uninspected into Russia will be there long after the war and will continue to make money by bringing counterfeit goods, poor quality medicine. At the end of the day, if you create something that is bypassing regulation, ultimately, it will be there to stay. This seems like a good point to start talking about the future. First off, are these Western brands going to fight for the integrity of their products in a landscape that's become an imports free-for-all. This is something that I'm sure these brands are putting a lot of thought into um, because obviously these are valuable assets. Um, again, considering that the people are trying to get those products from everywhere, these are brands that are well-loved in the region and in the country. So um, it's, it's going to be uh, interesting to see how this plays out from an IP perspective. Everyone is holding their breath to see once hopefully this this terrible uh, war ends, um, how things will go back to normal and then what the next enforcement steps will be. But here's something we haven't considered. Should the burden of preventing these abuses of their products fall entirely on the companies themselves? After all, the success of their exporters plays a crucial role in the success of Western economies. It is our claim that the responsibility to enforce trade policies is with governments and not with the private sector. And it is such governments who are willingly turning a blind eye to the flow of goods into sanctioned uh, Russia. These are the administrations that need to be accountable, be it neighboring countries, be it online platforms. The US government, the European Union can go and say, Stop it. And if we do allow ourselves to imagine a future where the Ukraine war is behind us and relations between Russia and the West have normalized, what happens then? Will European and American brands rush to regain their positions in the Russian market? And if so, will Russians welcome them back? About one quarter says they are upset and they don't want them back. Two thirds um, say they don't regret it at all. But, you know, when you think about two thirds, you think, OK, that's a majority. And yet uh, in a sizable market as Russian market is, even one third of those who say that they do regret is a lot. That's all for this edition of Business Beyond. But if you've made it this far, we reckon you'll enjoy this episode, too. We'll see you over there.